Sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the day, the thought of everybody, of every kid, of every parent was go to Mexico, go to Mexico, find an academy there, and eventually try to jump into the first team. That's what I did. But now that this is here, then I think it would be great for, for the future of the MLS. RGBFC and Houston Dynamo were very enthusiastic about the project. They can be exposed to an environment where they have fans, they travel, you feel that. The thinking of the ownership wasn't only creating a, a professional brand, it was a brand that was serving for the community, that was about the community. We're never quite accepted. We're not quite Mexican enough, we're not quite American enough, but we're our own thing. A lot of people from outside think that the Valley is so disorganized and they would never have a professional team. And now we have one. It's proving them wrong. Yeah back in Texas, and man, I missed it here. It's good to be home. Spent three years with the Houston Dynamo, the best part of my career. Two MLS Cup appearances. But the club has fallen outside the playoffs as of late, but has reimagined itself, taking steps in the right direction, and in some ways due to a unique partnership in MLS with their USL affiliate, Rio Grande Valley FC, with a player base and a community they are tapping into that's often overlooked right on the border between the United States and Mexico. Everybody, we're here with Dynamo legend Kalen Carr and from the MLS League offices. Dynamo legend, I, I can get, hey, get used no, to that. I mean, everybody recognizes the helmet, you're a recognizable figure, legend. With RGV, can you describe just how this partnership is structured? Because I think we get the idea that, yeah, players can come up and down, but just more from the uh, organizational standpoint as far as uh, the technical soccer side yeah. versus the organizational side or business side. Yeah, well basically to simplify it, you know, we run and control all aspects of soccer. And our partners with the, the group in the Valley, you know, they take on all the business operating sides, the stadium, the ticket sales, the corporate sponsorships. And it, it was a strategic decision with where RGV is located, you know, it's a soccer hotbed in the Valley. MLS, it's becoming a league of choice, as you know, and, and the, the quality of player is getting younger. You know, players, or young players in particular, that maybe used to try to get into a League MX side are now choosing, hey, I want to come to RGV, I want to come into your USL program, I want to come into your academy. And to me, that speaks volumes of the direction we're going as a league. When you guys started this partnership with RGV, what was the reaction like of people maybe around MLS? I think skepticism at first. And now, I mean, listen, I can't tell you now from my counterparts throughout the league, I probably get one call a week, you know, asking, okay, hey, you know, how's this project going? And you see clubs like San Jose, uh, Seattle now, and there's going to be several other clubs that are going to follow that model and it'd be almost like revolutionary in a lot of ways. Just in the last year alone, you know, we've signed four players from RGV. When you're a young player and you're, you're chomping at the bit to, to get that opportunity, is you got to be ready when that opportunity comes as well. And I see, I, you know, sometimes you almost feel bad for young guys to get thrown to the fire where they, don't, they haven't cut their teeth in real pressure environments. And that's what we feel, you know, with our structure and with RGV is, is critical. So I know we're talking a lot about youth development, untapped resources, and I got to hit you with the hardest question of the day. Yeah. When are you going to sign the Boniac Twins? Oh, well, listen, you've seen, what? hey, hey and, and they, one of them has a great left foot, by the way. Oh, yeah, I and, see him banging goals on Instagram stories, like, all the time. He's, like, crushing balls. Well, if, if they continue down that path, we're going to have to start at the academy level, at, like, U6 level here soon. In order for Rio Grande Valley to be successful, also, we have to be successful. For the players there, they say, okay, it works. If you're good and Memo is doing well and Kevin is doing well, now... If we, we work hard over here, we can go there. So it's a positive effect. What was the initial conversations like about going to Rio Grande Valley and being a part of that project? I was in Colombia and Matt Jordan, he said to me, it's a project to have a team in McAllen. To be honest with you, I heard about McAllen, but I'd never been in McAllen and I didn't know what McAllen, and, you know, he insisted a lot. He called me too many times. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, okay, well, okay, yeah. The project was to be the coach uh, with that new team, build the team from scratch, and the players to be 
developed for the possibilities to be with the first team in, in Houston. When you have to build something, that's a big responsibility. Players may be trying to find their way to the first team, but a coach coming to the first team, was this a part of the plan? The possibility for me to prove myself in front of, of a franchise that is an MLS franchise, I, I, took the, I took the challenge. It's a great opportunity to go to an environment where they love soccer and they, they've been playing soccer for generations, but they've been in a place where they've been a little bit far or not possibilities to have that environment handy. Now they have that right there. For me, that I've been seeing this league growing, this is a big step and this is being very positive, very big, but for them it's even better. People have this picture of undocumented immigrants and what they may or may not bring with them. And when I saw on the schedule that RGV was playing against LA Galaxy 2, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to talk to Miguel about what it's like growing up on the Rio Grande, except on the other side of the river. I got to ask just, what's it like for you to be back here and in an area similar to where you grew up, so close to Mexico, just over our shoulder? Looking over there just brings back so many memories. And I remember being one of those kids, like playing in the water, like walking over to the river. I think about all the times, you know, that I went to the river and, you know, we just would go swimming there and we'd see the, the patrol cars, like, you know, drive by on the other side, but we never really paid attention. Every 4th of July, we'd walk over to the border and sit on, you know, on this side of the river and watch the fireworks. And I had no clue what it was about and, you know, and now it's like, it all makes sense. But when we knew someone's birthday was coming up, it's like, hey, you gotta ask for a soccer ball, man. Like the one we have right now, it's wearing out. And if we didn't have a soccer ball, we honestly, we would just like put a bunch of little rocks in like a uh, two liter soda bottle. And we'll turn that into a ball. Guys in MLS don't wanna play if like the field isn't exactly pristine. You guys are playing with rocks. Dude, we used to play in like the middle of the street, like just two rocks in the middle of the street and like a beat up ball. Like we would sometimes wrap it in a plastic bag. So like, you know, like if it popped then it's like, okay, we at least can like squish it and like put more plastic bags tied up with rubber bands. Up until we moved out of there, there was like blood stains still on the concrete. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was brutal. And you know, after that, it's like, oh, well, I guess it's not as safe as I thought it was. There was an attempt to kidnap my sister and you know, I didn't know about it until I turned, I think 18, that's when they actually told me, you know, that, that was one of the main reasons why we left too. It's a decision people make that aren't necessarily, uh, they don't feel like choices. Yeah. That was probably one of my proudest moments, just, you know, the fact that my mom was able to do that for us. How did you make friends? Soccer. Yeah. And I saw a couple of kids playing soccer, so I like walked up to them. I remember asking the guys, like, hey, do you speak Spanish? And, you know, we just started talking, and, like they invited me to play, and then we just became friends from there. Did that actually help you learn a little bit of English? Yeah, learn all the bad words first, but... That's like my experience exactly the reverse, <laughs> where it's like, I helped to learn Spanish, but same thing, all yeah, the bad words all the first. bad words, yeah. <laughs> I've gotten a lot of messages from, from people I've never met, you know, on, on Facebook and like social media, just asking me, it's like, oh, you know, how'd you do it? Like, I want to do, you know, like something similar. Like, that's kind of, kind of what I always kept in mind, you know, if I can help someone, you know, if someone can read my story and go, well, if he can do it, then I can too. And then, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's all, all I've ever wanted for it. Do you want to uh, yell anything over to Mexico? No, they might come and get me. Somebody told me it's not 
quite Mexico. It's not quite the U.S. always. It feels like something different. Oh yeah, definitely. Once we're here, we're all orange. It doesn't matter. You're from Mexico. You're from Texas. You're from wherever. You know, once you're here, you're a, you're a Toro. The influence is definitely there. Border. The valley is its own unique thing, and we're really proud of it. Ni aquí o ni allá. Ni aquí ni allá. Ni aquí ni allá. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's cool. It. I heard that. That's a cool saying. It's our club. You know, that's what all we can say. You know? We don't support any other club. This is, we are, we bleed more. <laughs> Forever Orange. I've heard that several times. Well, it's such a melting pot. It seems like people from all different oh, yeah. walks of life here. Yeah. Believe me, I'm from Connecticut. Nah. You're from Connecticut? Yeah. <laughs> father always he used to take us to the stadium in, in Mexico all the time with theaters so ever since I was born it's my blood. Monterrey is like two hours and a half from here so every time we had the possibility we were there at the stadium. People in the area just watch mostly Mexican soccer so having people actually showing interest in, in the team and starting to support us it's good for us and good for the area. My younger brother they were actually take they were trying to take him to a, a club in Mexico and I know what it's like over there it's not easy especially the, the kind of money they pay some of the young players. I told them to focus in the U.S. and eventually if things don't go well, at the end of the day, you can get your degree or stuff like that and have a, a future as well. For example, if myself, I go to Houston and I do good and I prove myself, maybe Wilmer will look back and say, okay, uh, maybe I can start bringing more guys in and stuff like that. So, so I think this is a good uh, bungee to, to jump into the MLS. Both of my mom and dad found jobs here in, in the valley and half of their lives they lived here, half of the other life was <laughs> Reynosa, Mexico. I couldn't ask for anything else, I mean, training here, playing here, it's great. There's like a fair amount of guys on the team now who are from here. What's it like having guys who you grew up with now playing together as teammates? Only those people know what it feels like to to be playing for this team, it's not going to be an easy road to, to making it to the big leagues and, and we know what, what's needed of us to be there. I would love to end my career here, but obviously I don't want to be here for long. I think any player aspirations is to go play at a higher level and they don't want to be here for, for long. Soccer is number one globally, but it's number one for sure down here. I tell everybody, come one game and you're gonna be hooked. We were the very first ones to create a hybrid agreement with the Houston Rockets in the, in the NBA. Now after that, models took off. I think there was nine models after us, after we did the partnership with the Houston Rockets. So we were familiar with a, with a, with a hybrid. Somebody handles the basketball operations, we run the business operations. Same thing with us. We don't know a thing about soccer, or at least to the level that Matt Jordan, Nick Hova, and you know, obviously Chris Canetti, they're the pros at that. So you take over the soccer part and we'll be good. About a year ago, we had about 120 kids try out for our academy. We had over 610 kids try out a week ago for our academy. In so, one year? In one year. So. Well, how cool is it that they now don't have to leave? Yeah. They can stay right here and play for their hometown team. Obviously, 30 years ago for me, that would have been a dream come true. Now we're making dreams come true for other kids. There's a special pride and swagger that comes with being in Texas and playing in Texas. I felt it while playing with the Dynamo and in the way the fans supported our club and our community came around us. And I see that here in Rio Grande Valley as well and the way this community has come around the Toros. And I feel some pride coming back now and seeing how my club has created a bridge for this community and players that have often been overlooked. Now they feel hey, you know what, I don't have to go down to Mexico to have a chance, to have a future in professional soccer. And a special pride and swagger that I sense in them now that, hey, we can do it right here.